Hi, I'm Gretchen Stevens. I'm a biologist with Hudsonia, which is a, an environmental research institute based here in the Hudson Valley of New York. Today we're on a virtual field trip uh, looking at various kinds of habitats here in the Millbrook Preserve uh, in the village of New Paltz in Ulster County, New York. This is a program uh, we're conducting in partnership with the Hudson River Estuary Program of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation uh, and, uh, and with Cornell University uh, and funded by the New York State Environmental Protection Fund. In this virtual field trip, we're going to be looking at various kinds of wetlands here in the Millbrook Preserve. We'll look at their uh, ecological attributes. We'll discuss uh, some of the ways that they are or are not protected. Uh, and we'll look at the range of wetlands from uh, very wet to, to very dry um, so that you're well aware of the range of wetlands to be alert to uh, out in the landscape. I want to remind you of the definition of a wetland that's used by both the state and federal government. A wetland is just a place, a vegetated place, that's dominated by uh, plants uh, especially adapted to soils that are saturated for a significant period during the growing season. Although some wetlands have uh, permanent standing water, or intermittent standing water. Some wetlands are really quite dry for much of the growing season. Um, and we're going to look at ways to identify uh, even the dryish wetlands uh, during the periods when you don't have water to clue you in to the fact that this is, uh, is actually a wetland. Something else I'd like to remind you of, a wetland is always a wetland. Um, uh, water comes and goes. Uh, most of our wetlands, in fact, do not hold standing water through much of the growing season. Um, but if the wetland meets the criteria uh, uh, for defining a wetland, the vegetation and the soils and the presence of water at certain times, it is always a wetland whether the water happens to be there and visible uh, at the time you're, you're looking at it. Field observations are the best way to discover wetlands. Many, many of our wetlands do not appear on uh, any of the maps in the public domain, either the state freshwater wetland maps or the federal national wetland inventory maps. And so part of the, one of the purposes of this virtual field trip is to uh, keep you uh, alert to that fact and show you some of the ways to identify wetlands that may be very important ecologically, but do not appear on any of those kinds of maps. To identify wetlands, uh, the federal government uses a combination of three factors. Uh, hydrophytic vegetation, hydric soils, and indicators of wetland hydrology. That is, indicators that water uh, has been here uh, in the past. Even in the field, the dryish wetlands can be identified by, uh, uh, by these indicators, and, and they are required. The most readily observable indicators of wetlands are the vegetation, and that's what uh, most of us uh, rely on on a first glance uh, when we're looking at the landscape. Uh, each plant species is adapted to particular conditions of uh, the soils, uh, the sunlight, the, uh, uh, the wetness or dryness of the environment. Um, and uh, in recognition of that fact, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has put together uh, uh, a whole list of plants and their classifications as to their special adaptations for wetland conditions. Um, uh, uh, this, is, this list is used both by the state and federal governments when they are determining the uh, extent of their own jurisdiction uh, in wetland areas. The wettest wetlands, of course, are the easiest to identify uh, because they have standing water most of the time. Uh, it's the uh, drier wetlands like this one um, that create uh, larger problems, but I'm going to show you uh, some of the ways to identify uh, a wetland in a place like this.
here we are in this forest. Um, we're not far from a stream, and our elevation is not far above the stream. Uh, this area, uh, it looks like we are on a floodplain of a stream. Floodplains uh, usually contain both wetland and upland habitats, that is non-wetland habitats. Um, a wetland in this location might be very close to the same water table that is uh, feeding the stream itself. To figure out whether or not this is uh, a wetland, uh, we would look at the plants. Um, for example, here uh, is a sensitive fern. This is one of our very common ferns uh, uh, of wetlands in the region. Uh, luckily, it's also much easier to identify than many of our other ferns. It has these uh, leaflets that are only very sh shallowly cut. Um, and uh, there aren't really any other ferns around here that you would mistake for this. When you have this kind of fern in abundance, you can be pretty sure you're in a wetland. Uh, another good plant is this, the um, um, jewelweed. Uh, most of you are familiar with this uh, when it, it has an orange flower. Um, when it uh, produces uh, seeds, they're in a capsule that, um, uh, that explodes when you touch it, and that's how it gets its other name, Touch Me Not. Um, uh, this is a plant it can grow to considerable height. Uh, when you have a lot of it, uh, it's very likely that you are in a wetland. It, is, uh, it also will inhabit otherwise disturbed soils, but it seems to need quite a lot of moisture. Another uh, very common plant here in this vicinity is this uh, plant with these grass-like leaves uh, that creates this little tuft. And there's a lot of this around here. This is a sedge <clears throat> called a uh, brome-like sedge. Um, it, uh, it always uh, creates these tufts. Uh, it is a very good uh, wetland indicator uh, when you have enough of it. And um, uh, it, you can confuse it with other tufted plants. Um, and we'll see some of those uh, uh, here and in other wetlands that we'll be looking at today. Um, but these, uh, those three plants, uh, four plants actually, uh, uh, predominate in this area, the, the, the jewelweed, the um, <clears throat> sensitive fern, the brome-like sedge, um, and uh, one more uh, skunk cabbage. These very large leaves um, are of skunk cabbage, which is a, uh, it's a good wetland plant. Um, it first emerges uh, in the late winter or early spring um, with a, a flower on a stout stalk that's kind of hidden by a, a cowl-like leaf structure. Once the flower uh, produces the red berry-like fruit, um, uh, and the fruit starts to decay, these leaves emerge. Um, and they will uh, be here for a few weeks in the summer. These are starting to senesce, they're starting to decay, and in a short time these will disappear and there'll be no more evidence of skunk cabbage for the rest of uh, the summer. It will emerge again in the spring. This is not intended to be a lesson in wetland botany. There are many more uh, indicators of wetlands, both here and in other places that we'll look at today. Um, but just to give you uh, the, the general picture of how we identify wetlands when we don't have more obvious indicators like uh, deep water to, uh, to go on. The next question is, what kind of wetland is this? <clears throat> wetlands come in lots of different guises. Um, there are forested wetlands and open wetlands of various kinds. Um, they're all given names that reflect aspects of, their, of the, uh, the water condition, 
aspects of the kinds of vegetation, sometimes of the chemistry of the soils or, veg or, um, or water. Um, uh, names like uh, marsh and swamp and fen and bog and wet meadow uh, and so forth. All of those have very specific meanings for, very, uh, for uh, different kinds of wetlands. A wetland that's dominated by woody vegetation uh, is called a swamp. By woody vegetation, I just mean trees or shrubs. Um, and um, here where we're standing, where we seem to have a lot of wetland herbaceous vegetation, non-woody vegetation at our feet. Uh, the trees here, uh, we have trees like a swamp white oak, uh, green ash, there's a pin oak. Um, we have some other uh, upland trees here. That looks like a, uh, a red oak uh, and various others. There is a slippery elm. Um, uh, a wetland that is uh, dominated by trees, uh, we would call a swamp. And in this case, we could uh, refine that further, further and call this a hardwood swamp as opposed to a conifer swamp that would be dominated by uh, conifer trees. Although the, we can come over here, although the soil surf, surface is actually fairly moist today, <coughs> later on in the summer, this could be quite dry. Um, we also have these areas where the leaves have been uh, matted down and, uh, and are slightly dark stained and it looks as if they have been, this area has been uh, held some pooled water at times, uh, probably earlier in the season. This might hold water uh, at times again uh, during storms um, or other big, uh, big runoff events. Um, but you can't always depend on having uh, this kind of moist uh, soil to uh, clue you in to a wetland. This could be quite dry uh, in a few weeks, especially if this is a, uh, turns out to be a droughty summer. Um, so I would urge you to um, uh, rely on the vegetation uh, uh, more than other things. We will discuss later uh, some aspects of actually looking at uh, the soil profile um, to get into some of the more difficult details of wetland identification. Um, uh, but vegetation will tell you a lot. So here we are in a very different looking wetland. Uh, we are also on the floodplain of a stream, um, but here I'm surrounded by fairly dense uh, skunk cabbage. Um, <clears throat> uh, the ground uh, is more exposed here to sunlight. This, the uh, trees are more widely spaced. Uh, and so we get a somewhat different plant community. Um, skunk cabbage, of course, is a good uh, wetland plant. We have other plants here like this um, uh, wood nettle. Um, we have uh, swamp white oak among the trees. We have a green ash over there. We have a lot of these tufted uh, sedges. We have several different species in here. Um, including the very narrow-leaved uh, brome-like sedge that we found at, at an earlier stop. Uh, we have some jewelweed. Much of the uh, vegetation I'm seeing here uh, uh, is of wetland plant species. Uh, so there is no question that this is, that this is wetland. A, the vegetation of a uh, well-vegetated floodplain like this, whether we're in a wetland or a non-wetland habitat, an upland habitat, uh, is very important to the uh, water quality of the stream, to the habitat quality of the stream, and to the uh, management of floodwaters along the stream.
Uh, the vegetation and soils on a broad floodplain like this uh, are very effective at uh, slowing down uh, and absorbing floodwaters. Um, they are effective at uh, taking up and transforming uh, some of the contaminants in floodwaters and thereby helping to improve the water quality of the stream. Um, these areas uh, are also very heavily used by wildlife, some of which uh, simply use the stream corridor for travel, uh, many of which use this for various aspects of their, uh, of their life cycle. The, there are uh, birds that especially nest uh, along floodplains like this. Uh, there are birds that nest right on the stream bank, um, but they, uh, they feel protected by a well-vegetated uh, floodplain that uh, extends back from the stream bank, so something like a Louisiana water thrush or, or northern water, fr water thrush. Um, uh, these areas uh, are the kind of places where uh, if you put a new uh, uh, structure or a road or something else that's going to redirect or, um, or concentrate the stream water uh, is likely to uh, exacerbate flooding down, downstream. Uh, so the best thing to do is keep uh, all kinds of new development or, or new disturbance completely outside of these floodplain areas um, uh, and to allow the stream to rise and fall through these areas as needed, to allow the stream channel to move laterally as needed, as it will over time, uh, moving probably back and forth across this entire floodplain area over uh, years and, and decades. Another uh, important role for these well-vegetated areas uh, along a stream, um, whether they are wetland areas or not, is that they contribute a lot of uh, organic matter to the stream, the organic matter that is at the base of the, the, the stream food web. <clears throat> They also contribute living organisms, uh, a lot of uh, invertebrates that uh, develop in the floodplain areas will then uh, uh, drop into or be uh, captured by uh, stream uh, organisms themselves. Um, animals like wood turtles, uh, which spend a fair amount of time in the stream itself, but they move up out of the stream to forage in places like this. Um, t they use these areas to get to uh, other kinds of habitats that they might use for foraging uh, and for nesting. So here we are in a habitat area that I would uh, certainly call an old field, which is a habitat that often develops after uh, some agricultural use has been abandoned, the, the area is no longer managed, it's no longer mowed or cultivated. Uh, and it, they, These areas tend to grow up and do lots of uh, weedy vegetation, uh, a great array of uh, grasses and sedges and forbs uh, and rushes. Um, uh, these places can be very valuable for pollinators. There's often a wonderful array of wildflowers, uh, goldenrods and asters, and lots of other things that uh, provide uh, nectar and pollen for uh, native bees and honeybees and butterflies and moths and beetles and a lot of other animals that take advantage of those things. These areas are used by lots of other wildlife too. Um, by meadow voles and their predators like foxes and coyotes, uh, by snakes and by uh, frogs and salamanders. Um, this, uh, these retain some of the old uh, hayfield and pasture grasses that uh, probably were here when this was in active agriculture. But I noticed lots of uh, other things too that indicate uh, some wetness here. I notice a lot of wetland plants, for example, like purple loosestrife, which uh, will be flowering uh, probably uh, by late July. Um, uh, this is a plant called uh, broom sedge. It's a very common wetland sedge in the region. 
Um, what else do we have here? We've got some uh, um, soft rush here. Name because the stem is hollow, you can squeeze it. Um, we have a saw a dark green bulrush here. I'm not seeing right now. Um, there's this uh, whole array, here's the dark green bulrush, uh, of plants that suggest that there's a considerable amount of wetness here. Um, so is this a wetland? If it is, I would call it a wet meadow. Um, if it's not, I would simply call it an upland meadow or an old field. Um, uh, how would we find out if this is a wetland? The only thing that I would know how to do is, for one thing, to look more in more detail at the vegetation, see what the uh, relative abundance of the wetland plants and the uh, upland plants is. Also, I would need to look at the soils. And at our next stop, uh, I'll show you how we would examine soils to determine if an ambiguous area like this uh, is wetland or not. So here we are on a, uh, a flat terrace of a stream. We're not far from a stream that is drying up at this point. Uh, this is an area, it looks like it probably uh, once was part of the floodplain. It might still be part of the floodplain. Uh, and during high water times, this could be covered with water. Um, there are things about this that look to me like it is probably wet at times. There probably is some pooled water here. I say that because the, uh, the matted leaves, the dark uh, staining on the leaves, suggests that water probably stood here for some period, probably earlier this year. Uh, there are other things that uh, also suggest wetness. This tufted sedge, which is quite abundant here. This one is called Eastern Star Sedge. This is a facultative wetland plant. Uh, this is one that really occurs just as often in upland areas as in wetland areas, so it doesn't really tell us what we need to know about whether this is wetland or not. Some other plants here, though, are a little better indicators. There's foul manna grass. Looks like we have some seedlings of green ash, which is one of our uh, wetland tree species. Um, other plants here, though, are, uh, seem maybe to tell a, a different story. This is uh, Oriental Bittersweet. Uh, we have this, uh, this uh, Bittercress uh, and other, other plants that are not necessarily wetland plants, like uh, Japanese stiltgrass, although it likes moist soils. Um, so what do we do in a case like this? We have ambiguous vegetation that, that uh, doesn't uh, tell us a whole lot. What I would need to do to determine if this was wetland is look at the soils, and I'll show you how we do that. So this is uh, a tool called a Dutch auger. Uh, it's a fairly standard tool uh, for examining the uh, soils in the uh, near surface zone. Um, uh, as you probably all remember, um, the definition of a wetland is an, a vegetated area dominated by herb, uh, plants that are especially adapted to saturated soils in the rooting zone. Um, uh, soils that are saturated for a prolonged period during the growing season. Um, the, the soils develop uh, various characteristics that indicate uh, wetness and indicate, in some ways, the duration of, of saturation. Uh, that's because in, uh, in a saturated condition, the, um, uh, the soil environment is anaerobic, meaning uh, oxygen-free. And uh, the, uh, some of the minerals, like iron and manganese, develop in a, uh, a reduced state. That is, they add an electron and reduced uh, uh, iron develops these dull uh, colors 
Ah, this is too, the soil is too dry today, I think, to get a good core. That's a problem. Um, but we can get a sense of these colors. I can just show you how this works. I would ordinarily be uh, augering this to a, a much deeper level, probably down to 18 inches or so. Um, but <clears throat> uh, there is an example of the soil in the first uh, few inches. Um, this is a, it's a Munsell soil color chart, which is a, uh, a standard reference for uh, for uh, understanding the soils. Uh, there are certain uh, thresholds of hues and colors and, and uh, chromas and values that uh, we use to identify soils that have been saturated for a long period during the growing season. Um, these dull colors, um, for instance, like that, that's how we we get, we compare a, an actual soil to a, a color chip. It looks like this piece of soil is somewhere between those two. It might be at a, a chroma of two and a value of two. Um, on this page, which is called the uh, 10YR, um, uh, in this case, this would qualify as a, uh, as a hydric soil. Um, with this, uh, this sort of silt loam texture. Um, the actual evaluation uh, is, is a little more complicated than that, but I just wanted to show you uh, the, the general procedure for examining soils to determine whether they are hydric or not, whether or not they are wetland soils. Um, this is not meant to be a, a, a training session, but just um, so you, you understand uh, how this is done, and also that identifying wetlands uh, can be uh, can be complicated. Uh, wetland specialists have been trained especially in interpreting both the vegetation uh, and the soils and other indicators of wetness uh, to uh, to tell whether a, a, an area actually uh, does have saturated soils for long enough in the season. <clears throat> um, so. This uh, area is probably a wetland. Uh, that would be my determination here, as long as these, these dull, dark brown colors uh, extend to a, a good part of the, of the rooting zone. <clears throat> would a wetland like this be protected under the Federal Clean Water Act? Um, my, my guess is that this probably would. Uh, we're here on the apparent terrace of a, of a small stream. Uh, this stream uh, does run into the Mill Brook, um, uh, which is a perennial stream. Um, the Mill Brook runs into the Wallkill River, which is a traditional navigable water. And um, uh, this, this wetland is separated only by this very low uh, levee on the, at the top of the stream bank. And by uh, definition, in the current interpretation of the Clean Water Act uh, issued by the EPA earlier this year, a wetland like this would be considered an uh, so-called adjacent wetland um, and, uh, and therefore uh, would come under the federal jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act. So we've just come down through an upland forest with very little happening in the understory on the ground layer. We had a few uh, black cherry and ash seedlings. We had some low blueberries and some woodbine. But then suddenly we came out into this area, which is lushly vegetated. And we notice a few things uh, that caught our attention right away. Some of these plants, uh, we have a foul manna grass, this very delicate looking grass. We have sallow sedge, we have sensitive fern. We have a patch of cinnamon fern over here. Um, all of these are very good indicators of wetland. But even though it might not be obvious to you, we are on a, uh, a forested slope here. This is sloping very gently down. Uh, we're not uh, in a basin 
We're not on a floodplain. We're not in any of those usual areas where water collects and, and creates wetlands. Um, on, so what would be creating this, what looks like a very localized wetland on this slope? Usually, uh, uh, it would be a seep uh, or a spring that's, that's creating this. A seep is simply an area where uh, groundwater emerges uh, diffusely at the ground surface uh, under gravitational pressure. A spring is where groundwater emerges at a single location uh, under gravitational pressure. Uh, the water from springs and seeps usually emerges at a fairly constant temperature. Um, usually between 45 and 55 uh, degrees. Springs and seeps like this have a great many ecological values. Uh, they're used by a lot of plants and animals um, that uh, uh, reside here full time. Um, many uh, invertebrates are especially adapted to the the continuous or uh, intermittent emergence of uh, this cool groundwater. Uh, many animals use these areas intermittently. They'll use them during drought periods when other uh, water sources have dried up. They'll use them uh, in the uh, late winter and spring when these are some of the earliest places to green up and provide a lot of green uh, vegetation to, to graze on. Um, these, because the water emerges at cool temperatures, usually much cooler than the uh, surface water around, these areas can be very important at uh, maintaining the cool temperatures in springs and lakes and ponds. Cool temperatures uh, uh, in those water bodies uh, uh, help to maintain uh, large uh, or high levels of dissolved oxygen, which are is a very important habitat component for uh, fish and uh, invertebrates and other aquatic animals. These springs and seeps are often, though, also the very headwaters of many of our streams. Um, if you go to the very highest reaches of the, the Mill Brook, um, uh, it, it could very well start at a seep uh, or, or a spring, uh, just like what we're, what we're standing in here. Um, these, uh, some of these springs and seeps flow year-round. Some of them flow only intermittently. Um, uh, but in, in all cases, they, are, uh, they can be very important to the general ecosystem, both the terrestrial parts and the aquatic parts of the ecosystem that they feed. Here we have a very small stream uh, that's uh, meandering through this broad, flat floodplain. In the stream itself, uh, there is marsh uh, vegetation, things like uh, burr reed, this broad-leaved grassy plant. Uh, there's a, a kind of a neat-looking sedge here. This is a sallow sedge. Um, uh, there is water plantain down there, the, uh, the broad leaves. Um, these are right in the stream channel itself uh, and on the banks of the stream. <clears throat> but in the, in the rest of the floodplain here, we have other kinds of vegetation. We've got things like reed canary grass, which is a very common uh, wetland grass around here. We have foul manna grass with its very delicate inflorescence. We have jewelweed. And purple loosestrife. Very common in lots of wetlands around here. These are all plants that are uh, indicative of what we call a wet meadow. A wet meadow is a wetland that's dominated by herbaceous vegetation, uh, that is, non-woody vegetation. And, um, and it's a place where the water, the, the standing water, is uh, usually there for only a short period, if at all. 
during the growing season. Many wet meadows hardly have any standing water at all. Uh, wet meadows are quite a common habitat. They are in all kinds of settings. Right here, this happens to be in the floodplain of this little stream. Uh, I expect that this wet meadow floods probably annually, uh, at least once, maybe, maybe uh, several times in a year. Um, and, but it seems to maintain this uh, for, sort of wet uh, environment for long periods after the flooding. Uh, wet meadows are used by a great many kinds of wildlife. Um, <clears throat> they're used by, uh, by uh, small mammals for foraging and for, uh, for nesting, things like uh, meadow voles uh, uh, and mice. Um, they're used uh, by uh, birds sometimes for nesting, especially uh, wet meadows that have uh, low shrubs. Uh, the shrubs are the more likely nesting areas. Um, a small <laughs> wet meadow like this wouldn't uh, be used by uh, the kinds of uh, ground nesting birds that need large uh, meadow areas. Um, but where you have scattered uh, trees like this, those are uh, wonderful uh, hunting perches for a lot of the predators on the small mammals and, uh, and the nesting birds. So here we are uh, just upstream of the place we uh, were just looking at. Uh, here is a beaver dam. Uh, it's impounding water above it. There's also a little beaver dam below here, which we can't see from this spot, that's impounding this water right next to us. In fact, there is a whole series of beaver dams uh, running up about a half a mile of the Mill Brook at this location. Um, this is a really uh, interesting habitat where uh, beaver <coughs> find uh, a stream that is in the right kind of topo uh, topography um, and has the right kind of vegetation, mainly uh, the right kinds of trees. Uh, they uh, often build a dam like this out of sticks and mud. The dam impounds uh, water behind it, sometimes creating very large ponds. Um, the purpose of the dam is to uh, give them uh, better access to food, uh, which is mostly the trees and shrubs uh, <clears throat> that are flooded by the pond and that are near the pond. Um, they also, th these ponds often develop marshy vegetation, which you can see there in the, uh, in the background. Uh, the beaver also uh, consume some of that vegetation. Um, these, uh, the, the whole series of habitats that uh, develops uh, after the beaver build their dam uh, offer a lot of uh, value to the biological landscape. So here we are uh, looking at what a lot of people might consider a kind of classic wetland. Um, this is a, a, what we call a marsh. Uh, uh, a marsh is a wetland that is dominated by herbaceous vegetation, um, that is non-woody vegetation, uh, and where the water, uh, standing water, is there for uh, a good part of the growing season. Uh, some marshes have permanent standing water, uh, in some marshes, the water dries up at some point during the, during the summer. Um, but the water is there for a long time and it supports uh, a different kind of uh, vegetation than you would find uh, typically in a wet meadow. Here we've got cattails, which everyone is, is familiar with. Um, this uh, happens to be uh, one of the pools that is impounded by uh, one of the dams in that whole series of dams on the Mill Creek. Um, we're, we're a bit upstream from the dam we were looking at previously. Um, marshes like this, especially ones with a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of open water, um, support uh, a whole lot of wildlife, uh, somewhat different from a wet meadow. 
uh, I would expect to see something like um, muskrats in here. They would use the, uh, the herbaceous vegetation for food and for building their lodge. Um, they would build their lodge at probably uh, at the uh, edge of a deep marsh like this or, or on the bank or in the bank. Um, uh, I would expect to find something like snapping turtles uh, and painted turtles in a marsh like this. Um, uh, these, uh, certainly you would have fish uh, in a marsh like this, uh, fish that would be using other parts of the stream, um, but some that would also simply reside here. This would be their home for, for most of their life. So uh, this is a beaver pond in addition to being a marsh. Uh, most beaver ponds do develop areas of marsh, uh, although some have a lot of open water too. Um, beaver ponds uh, tend to go through a fairly standard evolution. Um, once the, the dam is built, uh, the pond develops, it tends to kill uh, the woody vegetation and lots of the other vegetation that was there before. Uh, over time, um, the, the pond will develop uh, marsh and, and maybe wet meadow at the outer fringes. Um, it will turn uh, some formerly upland forest areas into swamp, um, that is a wetland forest. Um, the beaver might be there for a few years or a few decades, or in some cases many decades. Uh, at some point though, they will uh, run out of food, uh, run out of easily accessible food, um, and the beaver will leave. <clears throat> um, once they leave and are no longer maintaining the dam, uh, the dam will eventually decay. Uh, uh, and, um, and the water will start flowing again, the, the pond will uh, decline. And it typically goes through uh, the, the stages, uh, a mudflat, once the water has, has essentially gone, the mudflat will turn into wet meadow. The wet meadow uh, will, uh, if it continues to be wet in that area, it, it, could, it could develop into, into marsh. But if the area continues to dry, depending on the, uh, a lot of things having to do with the hydrology of the area, uh, it could turn into uh, eventually uh, upland meadow and shrubland and eventually forest. Many of these places where beaver uh, are building dams they have been coming and going uh, from those places uh, over probably thousands of years. They leave when the, their food sources are depleted and they return once the food uh, sources have been replenished. Um, and uh, and in, the, in the meantime, both when they're there and after they've gone, the habitats that develop uh, make a tremendous contribution to the ecosystem uh, in general. Um, they are used by a tremendous array of, of wildlife all at the different stages. Uh, uh, raptors will uh, feed on animals in a pond like this. Um, uh, herons, as uh, I mentioned before, will take advantage of the dead standing trees. Uh, Songbirds of all kinds will be using uh, the marsh for, for nesting and for, for feeding. You'll have bats uh, gathering insects over a, an open water area like this. Uh, you'll have uh, uh, certainly muskrats using the pond itself. And then the whole array of wildlife that use the whole succession of habitats afterwards, the, the wet meadow, the shrubland, and the forest. Um, our landscapes here in the Northeast would look uh, entirely different if we did not have beaver as part of them. Um, beaver, uh, for those reasons, are very much uh, admired and valued by ecologists um, who are uh, interested in the biological diversity of the area and all the things that make our ecosystems work. So another uh, less visible part of a pond like this is the submerged aquatic vegetation. <clears throat> Just running my hand under the water. 
come up with a, a whole lot of stuff. There are several different species in here, things like this is mostly waterweed. Um, we have some, uh, some coontail. Um, there are probably some other things in here. It, and the vegetation is quite lush and abundant um, under the surface. Um, submerged aquatic vegetation like this uh, usually supports uh, loads of small invertebrates that use the vegetation for food, um, that use it for uh, as shelter from, uh, from predators. Um, and vegetation like this is also therefore a good uh, source of food for waterfowl and for fish who go there to feed on the plants themselves and also on the invertebrates that are often there in such great abundance. So here in a, in a pond like this that has both the, uh, the uh, indicator of the, the, the green, all the green plants on the surface and the very abundant submerged aquatic vegetation, it indicates that this is getting a lot of, uh, a lot of nutrients. But these are plants, every plant I'm seeing here is native, they belong here in our wetlands, um, and, uh, and they are part of this very uh, rich uh, ecosystem that the, the, deaver, uh, the beaver have provided to us. So this concludes the virtual field trip uh, on looking at the uh, various kinds of wetlands here in the Millbrook Preserve. None of the wetlands that we saw today uh, would be protected uh, under the state uh, wetlands law. Uh, and that's uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that, uh, the main reason is that none of them are on the freshwater wetlands map. Um, uh, it's possible that one of these wetlands might have been uh, part of a much larger wetland, 12.4 acres or larger, so could be mapped eventually. Uh, but uh, I would need to look at more of the site to, uh, to understand that. The only wetlands that we saw that would be uh, on the national uh, wetlands inventory map are the ones uh, along the beaver flowage, the various beaver ponds, uh, impounded by their dams uh, along the Mill Brook. Um, although they're not on the map, uh, uh, most or all of the wetlands that we saw today would be protected uh, under the uh, current interpretation of the Clean Water Act. Um, that's because uh, uh, all of them uh, or most of them are connected by wetland and or stream to navigable waters. The intermittent streams that we saw do run ultimately into the Wallkill River. Um, I also uh, r reminded you during this session that a wetland is always a wetland. We looked at a number of wetlands uh, such as this one which are uh, not very wet uh, during much of the, much of the year. Um, but even when water is not evident, even when the soils themselves are not saturated, if the wetland has uh, indicators of the basic uh, three factors, hydrophytic vegetation, uh, <coughs> hydric soils, um, uh, and uh, indicators of wetland hydrology, the area is a wetland, uh, whether it's in a dry period or a wet period. Um, I also w want to remind you that wetlands are sometimes difficult to identify. This would be an easy one, but the, uh, the old field that we looked at would have been quite difficult um, and would need a further examination of the, both the vegetation and the soils to make a determination. Be sure to, uh, where, where answering that question is important, be sure to bring in a wetland specialist who's uh, well trained in uh, identifying the soils and vegetation. We also discussed some of the ecological values of wetlands and some of the ways that wetlands serve uh, streams and other body, uh, water bodies and, uh, and groundwater. Um, and um, the importance of uh, buffer zones along wetlands to protect the integrity of the wetland habitats.
so thank you for, for being with us. Uh, I hope uh, all of you will have a chance to visit this uh, wonderful preserve uh, in the village of New Paltz. Okay, so we're here uh, now. We're no longer in the Millbrook Preserve, but we're at the Mills Norrie State Park over in Dutchess County. We came here because we wanted to be sure to show you and talk about uh, a, the very special kind of wetland called a vernal pool. Here we're going to be talking about the subset of vernal pools that we call an intermittent woodland pool, which is a vernal pool surrounded by upland forest. Just to remind you of the definition, a vernal pool is a uh, small pool, usually, that is isolated from streams uh, and from other uh, larger water bodies. Uh, it's a pool that usually holds water in the late fall and winter and spring, but then it dries up at some point during the summer. And as though it's those two things, the isolation from streams and other large water bodies and the drying up uh, seasonally that uh, are essential to the ecology of these pools. The drying up ensures that these pools cannot support a fish population. And many aspects of the pool ecology depend on, them, on the pools being fish free. These pools, um, um, I'll talk a little more about the ecology in a minute. I just want to be sure not to uh, forget to explain how to recognize them. Many people uh, are afraid that if they're not out there in the spring when the pools are full of water, they won't be able to find these pools. But in fact, these are very recognizable at all times of year, uh, except if they're covered with deep snow. The pools are usually in a shallow basin like this. Um, they uh, are very recognizable in most cases because the pool bottom is usually covered by this mat of blackened leaves. Both the matting and the blackening uh, indicate that the leaves uh, had uh, been holding standing water. Um, so those are the two indicators and they're uh, almost always there. Many pools have very little vegetation like this one, uh, except for the uh, Some have more vegetation than this, uh, but they all have a pool-like aspect, areas of, of open, unvegetated water. Um, um, so, to say a few more things about the ecology of these pools, these are usually very rich in invertebrates, many kinds of uh, insects in their larval stages, uh, mosquitoes, uh, aquatic beetles, um, also other things like ostracods, like fairy shrimp, one of my favorites are clam shrimp, but also fingernail clams, which are tiny little clams, uh, usually smaller than your, your little finger. Um, those invertebrates feed a lot of other things, uh, salamanders, frogs, turtles, lots of other animals, uh, birds uh, that feed in these areas. These pools are most famous as being the critical breeding habitat for a special group of amphibians, uh, which here in the Hudson Valley are um, amphibians uh, like the spotted salamander, marbled salamander, Jefferson salamander and wood frog. Um, they use these pools for a brief period for breeding uh, in the spring. The adults move in from the forest. Uh, they leave the pools after they've deposited eggs <coughs> um, and they spend the rest of the year in the forest. The eggs uh, develop here, they, they hatch out, the larvae develop here, and when they're ready, which takes uh, a few weeks to a couple of months, uh, typically. Uh, they, they move out uh, uh, into the forest where they also spend the rest of the year. Um, so in that sense, both the pool and the forest uh, are essential to the uh, support of those amphibian populations. In the forest, the, uh, the salamanders and the frogs, they spend a lot of their time under uh, logs and 
rocks, uh, the salamanders use the burrows of other animals, um, and, but they feed on uh, insects and, uh, and worms and other things on the forest floor. Um, uh, so that's the, 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 the general idea of these pools and the forest that are, uh, you should think of them as kind of a, a single habitat complex that is essential uh, to those amphibians, essential to the forest ecology, uh, and essential to the uh, ecology of the pools themselves.